Michelle, or are you recording? There we go. Thank you. Um, okay, we will uh, move to our open meeting now. Um, uh, we'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Please join me. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the flag, the flag of, of the United, United States, States, States of America, America. And, and to, to the, the republic for which, which it stands, stands, one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, liberty, with liberty and justice, and justice for, all. for all. Thank you. There is nothing to report from the closed session. Um, and so I'll move uh, to public comment number two. Do we have any um, public comment? If anyone has public comment, please use the raise hand feature or press star nine if you called in. And Dr. Bernstein, I see none. Okay. I will then uh, turn to the uh, report of the fire chief, item number one. Thank you, uh, Director Bernstein, members of the board, staff, and to our public that's tuned in. Um, this is my fire chief's report. Just a quick update on COVID. Uh, we're, we're seeing very little impacts uh, since our last meeting. We've only had one additional positive employee, no impacts uh, currently on our ambulance transport or hospital wall times, which is great. Other items to report, just a quick update on our station four construction. All of our board members have had the opportunity to take a tour of it and see what's uh, going to be necessary to get it to completion. We're still hopeful that we'll be able to occupy it towards the end of December. Fingers crossed on that. And then grand opening in April. Uh, we have a badge pinning, pinning ceremony next Tuesday. Uh, you are all obviously invited to come and attend. That will be Tuesday at 2 p.m. Um, it's not open to the public. It's open to retirees, board members, and family members. I'm looking forward to getting an opportunity to honor uh, our new employees as well as those that have promoted over the last year. Just I have an, an, a note here, and that's just an update on response times, not that I have any new response times, but in conversations with one of our committees, I just wanted to share that our hope is, is that in the first quarter, of 2023, we'll actually be able to start sharing some response times with the board. A lot of this has to do with us changing over with our reporting system and the purchase of an, uh, an additional module. Um, so looking forward to being able to share our response times with you. We had a meeting this past Saturday, really a great meeting. Lynn Bramlett co coordinated it and organized it and it kind of dovetailed in perfectly uh, with some of the things we've been talking about uh, with our new uh, our new program on community preparedness. Um, this was at the Episcopal Church on this past Saturday, really, really well attended. Uh, we had a couple of our board members there, some city council members, the city manager from Menlo Park, two police chiefs, and probably um, in the neighborhood of 25 really engaged community members. So. Um, it was about two hours long. There were some table exercises. I did a lot of listening. Lynn is, um, has taken everybody's uh, report out since she's going to put it together in a report. So I will share that with you when we uh, get it back from Lynn. But really um, productive meeting. So very good. Uh, just a quick update on our current recruitments. We currently have a deputy chief recruitment that's open. We had uh, interviews today. Uh, initially, we had 26, I think, applications. It was screened down to nine. We had an external fire chief uh, interview panel that went today. And so still waiting back on the results of those. Next step will be the top candidates will go to a selection interview with me. Uh, the administrative services director recruitment is still open. Uh, Fire Inspector 1-2 is open, and then I'm planning on bringing the job description for the volunteer coordinator to the board for approval in December. I was holding it open so we had an opportunity to hear some input from this community meeting we had on Saturday. Uh, we had bid night since our last meeting. That's just 
kind of an interesting thing. I'd never witnessed it before, but every year all of our rank and file folks are able to um, select new assignments based on seniority. And um, so that went mostly without a hitch and uh, looking forward, I think those assignments take effect in, in the beginning of January. I have a, a note on here, and this is just a, a point of interest, this district development projects, this came up during one of our committee meetings. And I don't have any report outs on it tonight, but what I wanted to share is that as we have um, significant new projects that are being proposed in the district, I will take an opportunity during my chief's report just to share with you what's on the table. So you kind of know what's going on throughout any of our three cities or in some of the unincorporated areas. And I think it just will be helpful for, for you to know and have a situational awareness of what's happening within our district. And then significant events, no significant fires, um, but as I'm sure everybody felt, we did have an earthquake on October 25th, 5.1 centered near San Jose. So up, up in our jurisdiction, it was a lesser quake, but um, yeah, we went through our normal protocols that, uh, you know, basically require a reporting out and inspection of the stations, the, um, sky alert system that we had did not activate, but it didn't fail. It just, it, the, uh, we weren't at our threshold level for that. So I got a report out from sky alert based on the magnitude and they said everything functioned normally. Everything went to the sensors in the proper time. It just it was below our thresholds for um, triggering our devices. Uh, with that, that concludes my chief's report for November. I'm open to any questions. Oh, I, had, I did have one other additional thing. I just remembered. Um, just a, a note, because this is kind of related back to that community meeting and just related to DSWs for certain members question was brought up at a prior meeting as to workers' comp insurance, and Francine checked into that, and if we did um, activate any of our CERT members as disaster service workers, they would be covered under California's workers' comp automatically. So it's not even the district, but California automatically covers them. That is the end of my report. Back over to you, uh, Director Bernstein. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, questions from the board for the chief? Uh, hearing none, I we will move then to the next item. Thank you, Chief. Sure. Um, this is item number two, and I uh, this is holding a public hearing pertaining to the Menlo Park Fire Protection District Ordinance. Um, do do I just open the meeting, or do I call on John or you, Chief, to uh, tee this up at all? I will let John take it from here. I'm not sure of the exact uh, specific steps, but I'm sure John can weigh in since he's been through it many times. Okay. Yeah, as uh, stated here, uh, what you would do is uh, open a public hearing and uh, see if there's any public comments in regards to this specific ordinance. Then based upon those, if there are any public comments, you can uh, look into addressing them. And then you'll close that public hearing. And then from there, I can introduce uh, adopting uh, our current ordinance. So I'll let you go ahead and start with that process. Okay, and please correct me if I err here. Uh, there are four ordinances that we will be dealing with, but this first item, item number two, pertains to the Menlo Park ordinance. And then we will deal later with the other three ordinances for, um, uh, Atherton, East Palo Alto, and the uh, parts of the San Mateo County. So uh, I will open the public hearing and ask for any public comment on the ordinance for the city of Menlo Park. This is actually for the Menlo Park Fire Protection District. This is a non-building standards ordinance. Yeah, that's what I thought. It's specific to everyone, right? Oh, I see. So I, I did have it wrong then. So the next hearing will be on all four jurisdictions. This is for the ordinance for the district itself. Correct. Okay, I apologize. Thank you. Um, uh, any public comment on the district's uh, ordinance? 
anyone has a public comment, please use the raise hand feature or press star nine if you called in. Director Bernstein, I see none. Okay, I will close the public hearing. Hey, Director Bernstein? Yes. Before you close the public hearing, let's just put on the record the fact that this public hearing was, notice of this public hearing was published in advance in accordance with the government code. Uh, thank you. And wh while we're talking about it, that's true of the uh, next public hearing as well. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Um, so uh, I will close the public hearing and um, move to item number three. And I'm looking for a motion to adopt the ordinance for the district. So moved. Do I have a second? I'll second. So Virginia has moved uh, and I've seconded the ordinance. Um, any any uh, comment or uh, from from the board members? Um, see none, I'll, I'll move to public comment. It may be redundant with item number two, but uh, is there any public comment on before we vote on this matter? And if anyone has public comment, please use the raise hand feature or press star nine if you called in. And seeing none, Director Bernstein, you may continue. Okay, if you would proceed with the roll call vote, I'd appreciate it. Director Jones? Aye. Director Crawley? Aye. Director McLaughlin? Aye. Director Solano? Aye. Director Bernstein? Aye. Motion carries 5-0. Uh, I'll move to item number four, which is the consideration of the four uh, building related ordinances for the town of Atherton, the city of East Palo Alto, uh, city of Menlo Park, and parts of San Mateo County uh, served by the fire district. Um, I will open the public hearing and ask for public comment. And again, if anyone has a public comment, please use the raise hand feature or press star nine if you called in. And again, I see none. Okay. As as our general counsel has noted, this this ordinance, uh, this hearing was um, there was proper notice uh, made of this hearing. Uh, seeing that there's no public comment at this point, I'll close the public hearing and move to item number five on our agenda which is to adopt the four ordinances for the uh, our comprising jurisdictions. Do I have a motion? So moved. I'll Rob, second. Rob moved and uh, I'm sorry, and uh, Virginia seconded uh, the motion. Uh, any comments from any of the directors? You know, Chuck, I, I just wanna recognize Chief Johnson for all his work. I know, uh, you know, this is an ongoing process throughout the year, it requires a great deal of effort on his part and his staff. So I just want to recognize that and thank him for that. Chuck, I have one uh, question maybe I can ask uh, Chief Johnson, if that's okay. Please go ahead. Um, and it's reference to, um, I guess, page 110, it's on the climate. Um, and the question is, Chief, uh, it, it seems like the, the rainfall and it comes between seasons uh, and in, in the report, it, it, up at the top, it mentioned between October and April. Uh, and then from, I, I guess, from, from May to, to September uh, is really where drought really kicks in. Uh, the question is, um, uh, what are uh, what do we do? Uh, are we doing, or have we done, or or planning to do uh, to um, I don't know help to try to mitigate some of the, especially during the, during that drought period. Do we have any kind of um, uh, information that we send out to residents or or? That's right, because the report, it, it talked about, you know, some things that, that residents can do, especially in those areas where there's a lot of trees and 
a lot of foliage, you know. Um, uh, do we have an awareness? I guess it's more like an awareness campaign set up to try doing that during those those seasons where we might have um, we go through our drought, uh, severe water shortage period of time uh, to be able to kind of um, you know um, I don't know in, inform the residents or or you know just just kind of making them aware of some you know what are we doing in that area if if, if kind of catch my sure. drift of what I'm trying to say. Yes, yeah, so our, our main area uh, obviously is weed abatement and addressing uh, anything that would be light, flashy fuels that would cause an immediate uh, spread or, or a cause in our area. And so that is our main focus. We do annually uh, put out postcards to all of Atherton. And of course, we post on our website and um, put out uh, advertisements throughout uh, <coughs> media resources in regards to uh, proper clearances and stuff that would apply. However, we do not have wildland urban interface in our district currently. Um, so a number of those items or measures don't necessarily apply. However, they're good practices, uh, but a lot of those practices apply for larger properties that are out in rural areas. Um, when it comes to, you know, like you're saying, trying to deal with trees um, and overgrowth, that is uh, an item that we need to look in how we would approach that with each of the cities, since each of our cities are trying to actually promote more trees, uh, increased uh, forestation of our cities. Mm -hmm. um, and so we need to figure out what a healthy, uh relationship with that looks like within our city so we do not address that because that is not part of the fire code necessarily in dealing with trees we do have you know we maintain it for our fire roads um making sure that we have those clearances so i stay within that realm but we do need to begin discussion of how we want to address climate change and that uh, future aspect part of the ordinance, we have a reference to a standards and guidelines manual. And in that standards and guidelines manual, I have made a recommendation uh, guideline for property clearance and maintenance for anybody in the district to voluntarily abide by. I know that there are um, two groups. I know one in particular uh is uh focusing on on uh climate related issues um well actually two one in in the Bellhaven area as well as one in East Palo Alto and I'm not sure what's existing in, in uh, Miller Park um but I I think in terms of uh, any kind of work effort that you may come up with that to maybe get the message out or the word out uh um, I think those two groups can really be a resource to you, uh, and to your department in terms of, because they are working directly with, with other organizations that want to plant more trees. <laughs> uh, I know it needs to go out there. And, uh, you know, like you say, it, it, planting the right tree would be important. Uh, and the maintenance of that tree is going to be even more important. Yeah, it is, a, it is an interesting challenge. I do know that right now each of the uh, city arborists are definitely seeing a lot of stress and are actually working on removing trees, uh, which is a uh, you know, good cooperation right now for us. So, But we do need to find a good uh, relationship with, with the cities and find what's going to be healthy as we deal with climate change. And some of it may get forced on us soon. Um, when the state of California comes out with their new uh, wildland urban interface zone maps. And so it may get forced on us here in the next year or two. But uh, also just so you guys are aware um, at this time, uh, each of the cities were notified as required by law uh, to the building officials. And they were also, these ordinances were presented in front of each of the city councils. Uh, San Mateo County, I have not heard a response from, but they have received it. Uh, the town of Atherton uh, went before their council, um, answered a few questions, then there's no comments. It will be ratified tomorrow night. The city of East Palo Alto, city of Menlo Park, 
extremely easy first uh, readings, no questions, and those should be ratified on December 6th. And I'm still reaching out to San Mateo County to find out when it will be on their agendas. But just so you know, uh, we've received no um, comments or feedback for any changes from any of the cities in the town of Atherton. So um, it, it was great being able to see um, it go through so easily this year. Thank you. Uh, John, I, I wanted to follow up on, on uh, Robert's uh, question a minute ago. Uh, you referenced climate change. Am I correct that the fire ordinances themselves won't reflect other aspects of climate change like like flooding and things like that? No, that is not the intent of of the fire code. The fire code's intent is twofold. One, it's to address building construction aspects and um, and that's where we can address, you know, if you want to call it climate change, but really it's fire propagation depending on where you're building. And the second is it is a maintenance code. So it's a maintenance of all of the life safety systems that are in existing buildings. Um, so if you wanna address climate change and that impact, that is really something that we need to look into partnering with each of the cities and how they are addressing climate change and what our role is in that. Um, but that's not something that the state fire code will address either. Is that is that correct? Um, overall, no. I would say there's some indirect aspects that that are being addressed, but overall, that is not the in, intent with the fire code. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any other comments from board members? Questions? Um, let me ask then for public comment on item uh, number uh, five here, the approval of these four ordinances, local ordinances. If anyone has a public comment, please use the raise hand feature or press star nine if you call them. <coughs> and Dr. Bernstein, I see none. Okay, well, we have a motion and a second. Uh, could we proceed to the, um, to the uh, roll call vote, please? Director Jones? Aye. Director Crawley? Aye. Director McLaughlin? Aye. Director Solano? Aye. Director Bernstein? Aye. So the uh, motion is approved 5 0. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our consent calendar is next. We There are three items on it. Let me first ask if anybody would like to remove uh, either the minutes, item number six, the treasurer's report, item number seven, or the resolution for continued remote meetings, item number eight. Okay, so we can vote on this as a whole. Um, could I have a motion? So move to, to approve the consent calendar for items six, seven, and eight. Okay, I have a motion. I need a second, please. I'll okay. second. Was that Rob? Jim. Oh, Jim. Thank you, Jim. Um, okay. And uh, comments or questions from the board? Any comments on these items? I, I have just one that I'd like to make, and that is that um, I don't know how much detail any of you have looked at the, the treasurer's report, but it contains some improvements over uh, previous versions uh, that I think have clarified it and given the board a little bit more information about where we were in the past, where we are today, and what we expect in the, in the future. And so uh, I think the presence of our new finance um, uh, director uh, has, has uh, contributed to that and the chief's uh, uh, role and obviously um, Long has participated in that too. I don't know to what extent, but I just know that the report is uh, an improvement. So um, I look forward to continuing refinements over time. Um, any other comments? Okay, um, we move to the roll call vote, please. Director Jones? Aye. 
Dr. Crawley? Aye. Dr. McLaughlin? Aye. Dr. Solano? Aye. Dr. Bernstein? Aye. Consent calendar is approved 5-0. And we'll move then to item number nine on our regular agenda, which is the uh, fiscal year 2022-23 property tax revenue budget. It's very far back in our packet. Let me turn to it myself. Item number, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not there yet. It's on page 347, Chuck. Thank you. Okay, here it is. Um, and um, uh, Chief, would you like to address the- I'm gonna this? turn this right over to our finance manager, uh, Elaine, it's all yours. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Director Bernstein. So good evening, everyone. So the enclosed report is really just for the board's informational purposes. We also presented it to the finance committee last um, November 1. So it shows the comparison between the property tax budgeted and estimates from the county. So again, these estimates do not include property tax refunds, prior year payments, uh, ERAP rebates, or SB813 funds. So these categories of the property tax are not discussed in this report. Um, this report would only include certain property tax revenue categories, such as the secured, unsecured, homeowner property tax refund, unitary tax, and the ERAP shift. So as can be seen on the tables on pages one and two of the report, the total amount budgeted for the revenue categories mentioned amounts to 57.2 million, while the county estimates totaled to 61.6 million, which is a 4.4 million overall favorable difference or a 7.8% increase. The comparison and details again in each category are presented in page two of the report. Um, it is worthy to note that you know, most of the difference is coming from the secured property tax. There is a 5.1 million favorable difference between the district's budgeted amount versus the county's estimates. And secured property tax has roughly 198,000 unfavorable difference. HOPTR and unitary tax have minimal favorable difference of about 2,500 and 95,000 respectively. And lastly, um, the ERAF shift has an unfavorable estimated difference of 524,000. So that's the summary of the report. And again, that, and also that concludes, you know, the presentation. So if there are any questions, I'm open for, I'm open now for any questions or clarifications that the board may have. Okay, questions from the board? But let, let me just get um, clarification. I'll, I'll, I'll state what I was looking for, but if you could just confirm this, I'd appreciate it. Um, the board will have a mid-year review sometime in the spring, February or March, in which we'll look at our budget. We, we certainly have the opportunity at any time to revise our budget. Um, and if there was something terribly unfavorable here, uh, we might be looking at it now. But at this point, what, what we've typically done in the past when we've done better with the property taxes and so forth is waited till the mid-year review and then decided whether or not we'll revise the budget at that time. Um, is, is that the procedure that you expect to follow at this point, Alain? Yes, that's correct, Director Bernstein. Okay. Okay, any any comments? This is good news, $4.4 million over and above what we thought we were gonna be doing. So, um, okay. Um, Do we do we need a motion here, or do we just receive the report? I, I think we just received the report at this point. Um, I mean, it's just to accept the fiscal year 2022-23 property tax revenue budget. So we'll just accept it. I think it's good news. Okay. Thank you so much, Elaine. This was Thank brought you. to the finance committee, and, and the, the finance team has done a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let me ask uh, from the... Public, if there's any public um, comment on this item, item number eight. Item number nine. nine. Oh, item you. number nine. I'm item number nine. Thank you. If anyone has public comment, please use the raise hand feature or press star nine if you call in. 
And Director Bernstein, I see none. Okay, well, we will move then to item number 10, which is um, to review and discuss outreach efforts for future firefighter recruitments. Uh, this is the chief's report. Perfect. Thank you, uh, Director Bernstein, board members. This was um, this board. This report is a result of a, a July 19th board meeting that in which direction was given to us to come back and report out what our intended efforts were going to be. I think at that board meeting we had shared some of our um, some of our demographic statistics, and there's quite a bit of conversation about what we could do to cast a wider net and ensure better access to anyone that's interested in working for the district. So this report is really just a conversation, giving you guys uh, some ideas as to what some of our plans are. It's not set in stone. We're still, um, I think the reality is as we move through this and move forward, as we learn from our uh, the different um, items that we're proposing here, we're going to keep growing and, and keep um, expanding our our um, efforts here. So let me let me talk about some of them uh, that we're planning on. First of all, our next opportunity we actually had an opportunity to hire coming up with a spring academy, and I think the reality is in in chatting with Francine that we we'd be too far behind the curve even if we weren't going to do anything new, just with creating a new list based on old practices. So. We're going to delay hiring a new any any new recruits until the fall of 2023, which will allow us to implement a good number of the um, efforts that we're going to be discussing in this report. Um, so, really, our desire is is to attract really well qualified tan uh, talented candidates to our fire district. <coughs> a lot of this focuses on the you know the firefighter ranks, but really. These are going to be practices that we'll implement in a lot of our recruitments, you know, and just providing some outreach. So everybody has an opportunity to learn about opportunities in the Menlo Park Fire Protection District. So outreach is going to be one of our first efforts. You know, qualified candidates can only apply if they know that there's a job opening available. So HR has been doing a great job with posting in a lot of the, the normal places. You know, it's government jobs, there's firecareers.com. Our, our plan is um, to expand that and expand it into our community. Some of it's gonna be working with our, our local partner agencies, putting the word out. I know um, City of East Palo Alto had a job fair that we were invited to. It was, it was last minute, so we weren't able to attend, but it's gonna be opportunities like that. Um, also, some of it is going to be doing some outreach and advertising in both online and print media. And I give some examples there of uh, some local bilingual papers, um, El Tecolote, La Voz Bilingual, El Observador, Wind Newspaper, which is Chinese, Epoch Times, Sing Tao USA, and then EPA Today, um, all of which it's not, you know, it can be that and then some, but just giving you some ideas of where we plan on uh, doing some outreach. Sometimes it may may not be, uh, it may be that we don't actually touch the candidate, but we may touch the candidate's parents who can then you know, share that with our, our potential future candidate. As we um, also look at trying to attract qualified women into uh, applying for the firefighter job. We're gonna do some outreach at some of our um, local universities in the collegiate athletic programs. We've, I've personally ex uh, experienced success in recruitment efforts in some of these things, uh, in those specifically. Um, you know, we end up capturing both qualified men and women uh, collegiate athletes, but it just gives us a good opportunity to reach out and touch them physically qualified folks. Uh, and then some outreach efforts at our local gyms, our CrossFit gyms, we find a nice cross section of people there. So there'll be some efforts that we'll also do there. One of the things we're gonna also do is we currently are working with a vendor on updating our website there. It's gonna be very so much more user friendly than it currently is. It will also have a recruitment page on it. So if you wanna work here, 
it'll be very simple simple to go on click on the link and we'll share with you everything that's happening in the in the district with recruitment future recruitments how you can be successful and that gets into the next part the efforts for success you know and that's one of those questions that um, we want to ensure that once the opportunity is there to apply how do we ensure that a candidate has a uh, you know fair opportunity to be successful and and some of this is goes to just that concept of trying to level the playing field you know for those people that have grown up in the fire service um, a lot of times you kind of have if you know somebody a family member an uncle a relative or a good friend that happens to be in the fire service you almost have a leg up because you know what it's about uh, you have the opportunity oftentimes to go to fire stations and do practice interviews and so we've asked ourselves that question how do we level the playing field so that the first time candidate who doesn't have a friend in the fire service knows what it's like to be a firefighter you know how to properly interview the the interviews for firefighter candidates um, it's different than your regular eight to five job where a lot of times you know you know, those things are oftentimes based on office skills or skills you've learned in school. A lot of this has to do with, um, you know, working in an environment where you live with other people for 48 hours straight, you know, working under adverse conditions. You know, and our plan is, is we already have a video content cadre that works for us. We've uh, prepared some recruitment videos already for our cadet program. So our plan is to pair and post up to our website, some videos that share things like a day in the life of a firefighter. So that people understand it's um, it's not your everyday job and we want people to have their eyes wide open as they pursue a career in the fire service. Yeah, we'll also share with them, you know, what a, what a successful interview looks like so they can see what that is compared to what they're used to with their regular office job interviews. Um, We'll share those those things with them. Um, teach them and give them some opportunities how to physically prepare to be a firefighter. So they're not just gym smart, but they they are basically like streets. Uh, I shouldn't say they're not just gym strong, but they're street strong. You know, related to these skills, we might set up an opportunity to you know on a Saturday or something like that come down and work out with the firefighters we can set up some videos and also display those things um we also want to make sure that uh people have access to some of our already successful outreach programs and that's our explorer and cadet programs um, we actually have a pretty diverse group of folks participating in those programs um we're gonna we will provide links on our website uh, to practice written examinations. Again, these are, you know, for the, you know, young folks that have taken a lot of these, they, they know what they're about. They, you know, end up scoring better. So we want to provide people the opportunity to take some practice exams. So they're not seeing so, the written test for the first time. They're not seeing this new idea and concept of this type of written exam for the first time. So, um, the testing uh, company that we're planning on using has uh, practice exams that, that potential candidates can actually take in advance. So here's some of the things that we're going to change from also from how we've done things in the past. We, uh, the last time we tested, uh, we used uh, the FCTC the firefighter candidate testing center. This is done through, um, it's a it's a basically a labor-based um, organization that's in partnership with California Professional Firefighters and with um, the state fire marshal's office. They, they have a fully vetted written exam and they, they're also the administering agency for the, the candidate physical agility test, the CPAT. Yeah, the challenge that we found with that last test is that when when we when we drew from that test and pulled candidates from that test, everybody else in the state of California also was using that same candidate pool. So um, 
it, it meant slimmer pickings. It meant that, you know, candidates that were highly desirable were already selected by other agencies. So our, our plan will be to use National Testing Network, who has an equally validated test. Uh, what's nice with them is they will uh, sell us the exam so we can administer it as our own test. FCTC is not willing to do that. Maybe someday they will be. Um, what to do is create our own minimum requirements, administer the test. It can be done online. Um, and then everybody that's on that exam will basically be just on, on our district's list. And we can create the criteria for selection. Our plan right now is just to have a minimum passing score of 70. And everybody who scores a 70 or above will move on to the next step in the process. And that would be a structured oral interview, excuse me. So the concept here is casting a really wide net, right? What we've found in the past is that when we set a minimum passing score that's higher, um, we screen out uh, a lot of our diversity. Um, and, and a score of 90 or above on this written exam is not necessarily a good indication of success as a firefighter. So it's one of those um, barriers to entry that really isn't necessary for us in, in selecting somebody who's just uh, a good firefighter candidate. So what that will do is it will cause us to need to interview more people, which, you know, logistically can be a challenge, but um, with a little time and effort and additional, um, you know, uh, resources, we can do it. Our, our plan is right now is to potentially use a, um, a service called Spark Hire. This allows us to manage a much larger number of structured oral interviews. The candidate will actually, from their own device at their home, um, go through the structured oral interview process and they basically record it onto their device and it gets submitted to us through the Spark Hire application. So they're asked the questions by a recorded interviewer. It gets recorded and sent to us. And the nice thing is, is that we can now have the interview panels review the interview at their own convenience from the fire station, from, you know, if we use some outside folks, you know, they can do it from the comfort of their office, you know, in East Palo Alto or whatever agency they, they happen to come from. Will help us reduce our costs, allows us to screen a larger number of candidates, and then that top group will move on to selection. So really the hope is, is that we've got a much larger group of candidates that aren't artificially um, screened out for something that doesn't matter to us. So as far as our um, minimum requirements are go, that's in the last paragraph there on page 352, where again, we're trying to not create any artificial barriers to entry. So minimum age of 18, GED or high school diploma, they need to have a current EMT certificate in order to apply what they don't necessarily need is to have the uh, CPAT certificate in hand to apply. Um, and the reason for that is that they'll, they'll need it before we hire them. They'll have to demonstrate they're physically capable. But oftentimes, you know, somebody who may be newly interested in the position hasn't taken the CPAT exam. And the CPAT exam is administered you know, once every two months in locations that aren't super convenient for us. So we want to make sure that somebody doesn't see our job announcement and go, oh, I can't apply because I don't have a CPAP. When they can apply and start going through the process and then take the CPAP as they're still working their way through the process. Ultimately, we get the same result as we only hire somebody who's passed the CPAP. We're just not pushing that requirement up front. Um, then beyond that, some of, the, some of the conversations we've been having have also been related to some of our just internal DEI efforts that we've had, you know, beyond, beyond recruitment and retention, but just some of our own internal training. So that last uh, paragraph on that staff report talks about some of our current efforts that we have ongoing. We have um, 
ongoing uh, harassment training that HR is putting on this current quarter. We also are launching this week um, uh, a really interesting program, this Gateways to Inclusion Diversity Dialogue. Um, yeah, those are just really the, the purpose of some of this new training is just to um, share with our employees the, you know, the fact that we value people's experience at work. We want people to feel included and valued at work. Sometimes that just comes from having respectful conversations and understandings with people. And so really what you're gonna see over the course of the next year is similar programs to this that we're gonna introduce. Um, they're just best practice training programs that a lot of companies and corporations are using to ensure they have an inclusive workforce and work environment. So that is the end of basically the conversation related to the staff report. I'm open to questions and or input from our, our board. But let me start here with the questions first, Chief, sure. and then we'll get to the uh, comments and input uh, second. Uh, what about any, any uh, questions on either the staff report or what the Chief has said, clarifications? Rob, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Chuck. Uh, I just want to get, uh, Chief, the basic requirements, GED or high school, what is the age cutoff for that? So right now, the minimum age is, is 18. I think when I had drafted the staff report for the um, HR committee, I had it tentatively set at 21. Interestingly, right. I, I had some conversations with staff internally. Okay. And yeah, I, I'd just like to share. I mean, that was my own personal experience is I haven't hired anyone under 21. And it turns out that in Menlo Park, we actually have um, hired some, some of our folks that have gone through our cadet program. And the last thing I want to do is, um, you know, make it that, so somebody else steals our 20 year old cadet and we don't have an opportunity to hire somebody who's great because I, I set that age there. But that's okay. why if you're wondering about the change, uh, no, that's fine. No, that's, sure. you know, it, and then uh, Chuck, can I continue? I, I, I just have two, I just want to go over the entry uh, level. But are they, they're questions, right? Well, there's, I'm just asking about, I just want to get the verification from the EMT. And do we have a, a way that we could give veterans points to applicants? I will check with Francine, but I'm sure there's got to be a way. And usually those are awarded at one point in the examination process. Okay. Thank you. That's all I have, Chuck. Thank sure. you. Okay. Other questions from? Yeah, I, I have a couple. Oh, go ahead, Jim. You, uh, Chief, you, you mentioned the uh, the cadet program. I, I seem to recall we had to suspend that during COVID. Has that been reactivated? It is, it's been reactivated and it is going um, really well. We actually increased our number of cadets to 18 uh, and that was in support with labor. So we have a, a really good, robust, diverse pool of cadets and it's going strong. Great, thank you. Uh, Chief, I had a couple just for the sake of my understanding here. Uh, thank you for laying this out in, in great detail. Uh, on, on the second page of the report, page 352, the paragraph that has the header efforts for success. Yes. Uh, in the fourth line, you mentioned this also, but you mentioned this video content cadre. What is that? <laughs> it sounds probably more impressive than it is. Really, it's, um, it, it's Charles Washington, one of our firefighters, who's got a skill set to create videos. So I've I've given him the the informal title of a video content cadre. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I think he has help, but you know that's that's really what it is. And I think you answered this question, but I just want to be sure. In the next paragraph, the second line, you said that shares the same list throughout the state. This is the when you said the list. This is the candidate pool that you're referring to. So I'm. Can you just repeat the question? Was it what that I was referring to? <clears throat> you mentioned something about a list. No, and sure. it says here, that it shares in the second line, it, 
the, the testing process that shares the same list throughout the state. Yeah. The same list so, is the list of candidates. Is that right? Yeah. So this is um, this is the state's uh, process, this FCTC process. If you're somebody who's interested in becoming a firefighter, you sign up for and take this FCTC exam. And it's a, it's the same exam and along with the, the CPAT. And what happens is you'll get a score and you'll be placed on this statewide eligibility list. And what will happen is that as agencies are interested in hiring off of that list, they'll reach out to candidates on that list and check to see if there's interest. Do you, you're on this FCTC list. Would you like to interview with Menlo Park? Would you like to interview with Sac City? Would you like to, yeah, so, but it's all coming off of that one pool of candidates. The candidate has some discretion as to who they ultimately want to test with, but it's a, it's a single large pool of candidates. And it's, uh, it's, so it's not a unique list. Anyone who uses FCTC has access to the ex ex exact same candidates. I see. And what we're trying to do is create a unique list that's unique just to us. And okay. so that our recruitment efforts and our outreach efforts, um, nobody else gets to take advantage or um, you know, is enriched by them. And then you mentioned changing testing services here to the National Testing Network. Mm -hmm. and one benefit was that they would sell the test, but it wasn't clear to me what the benefit of that is. Would we modify it somehow? No, oh, no. So, you know, it's interesting. National Testing Network is, um, they basically do mm -hmm. on a, a national level what FCTC does on a state level. So they have two different options. One is, Again, if you're an interested candidate, you can you can take the NTN test and be become eligible on a nationwide firefighter recruitment list. The NTN will also allow you to just purchase an exam that they will administer. And when somebody takes that exam and, and um, yeah, they get their score, they don't go on NTN's national list. It can be a unique list that's just owned by Menlo Park. So it's a it's a fully vetted um, testing company. So everything's, you know, the actual content of their tests have been vetted through legal and everything else. The only thing that's different between the two is they'll actually sell us the list, uh, sell us the test, let's say it's $10,000 for the test. Whoever takes it, we are the only ones that get the scores. We are the only ones that have access to the candidates and their scores. No one else in the country does. Oh, I see. Hopefully Otherwise, hopefully that explains it. If, if under the first thing, when we give them, when <laughs> people take the test, I, I, I see. So this, it's it, these two reinforce each other basically. It just allows us to have our own list of people. Right. Okay. Thank you. I, it wasn't clear to me. Sure. Um, other questions about uh, the report. Okay, if not, let me open it up to comments and, and uh, observations and, and so forth. Um, anybody want to make some observations about? This is an observation, Chuck, if I may. Chief, uh, on page 352, yes. the last on page of the report, your second, which is your second page. Mm -hmm. The last paragraph, the the first sentence in that says the district will consider establishing minimum requirements for applicants. Um, and and then when if you go down to the last sentence where it says candidates that meet uh, only the bare minimum uh, requirements likely would not be competitive in the process. My assumption was that it, it there's almost like a what's that term a dichotomy almost is it in terms of bear, it, it, the district establish it uh, consider establish a minimal requirement sure. and then in the same breath was saying candidates that that meet only the bare minimum requirements likely would not be competitive. I, you know, so, so I'm, are, I assume that maybe there's a minimal and then there's a bare minimal um, in terms there, of 
terms of uh, just the requirement sure. or was the assumption was, I, it sounded like there wasn't an assumption that you, you got the minimum requirements and then, then, then you got the bare minimum requirements. Uh, so I assume that there's two different. Right. So this is, you know, it's, I mean, that's a great point because it does, it seems to conflict or send a mixed message. What I'm really trying to do is just be really um, transparent. You know, so. I got it. The I, candidate, yeah. yeah, the candidate that <laughs> just has only those things and nothing else, no other life experience, it's going to be a challenge for them to be successful and competitive in an interview process. You know, if they've just got those things and then they sat on, on their mom's couch and played Nintendo for the last five years versus somebody who went out and was working two jobs to help support his family or regardless of where, where they are, you know, it's just, you need more essence to your self and life experience in order to be competitive, to be that kind of person that can respond into people's homes and, you know, understand. Um, so I don't, I don't know if that makes sense, Director Jones. No, no, but, no it, it makes yeah. sense. I, I think somehow it needs to be, there needs to be some, there's not enough room in between. To, right. Because the interpretation can be, oh, well, you know, it, <clears throat> establishing minimum requirements to get folks in, but you still on the same breath, it's a candidate that only meet the bare minimum requirements. And so I don't know how you separate that to kind of. Yeah. And we'll, we'll try and share, you know, what successful candidates can look like, um, you know, on our website and with some videos and some information. And, you know, the really, the, the thing I want to uh, be able to share with people too, is there's so many different paths into the fire service and it, doesn't need to be having been one of our cadets or working on an ambulance or working for the Forest Service or CAL FIRE, which is normal for folks that do that. You may have been a collegiate athlete or been in the Peace Corps or worked customer service at Costco or, you know, waited tables or, you know, worked three jobs to help support your single mom, you know, all, a variety of different things um, you know, or been an accountant, yeah. you know, <laughs> so lots of different paths and and we appreciate that um you know the diversity of experiences that that brings to to the table okay thank you okay other comments from board members yes have go my ahead. hand right go ahead virginia so chief thanks for this information i think it's it's great and um, thank you for taking into consideration some of the issues that the DEI committee discussed um, a few months ago. I, I just wanted to ask you, so have you, did you work with the Firefighters Association or our Firefighters Association with some of the, to, with, to come up with some of these um, guidelines and the changing of the tests and, and all of that? And, you know, what kind of feedback did you get from them? a great question and i did not i will i will check in with them all of this was all based on my experiences that i brought with me from ventura county so i'll i'll check in with them though and make sure there's there's no issues i will oh, yes thank you uh chief i had a couple of uh comments um <clears throat> the um I I really appreciate uh, the kind of the 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 reach of this and the breadth of of what you've done here. I mean, I think you've it's it's wide ranging, and I think it's also more than just superficial. It's wide ranging and in depth at the same time. Um, and my comments relate to problems that I saw in the past that were kind of. Uh, heavy-handed or or just so obvious that I hope that we never see them again. But uh, just one comment here in your list of uh, publications, I, I think this is this kind of has a, a reach of uh, kind of ethnicities and so forth. But I, I'm sure there's some publications that relate to gender issues or female things, and I I would encourage you to. I, I can't even recommend anything, but. Um, uh, but to to look into that as well, um, I will. Yeah. Um, the 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 comment that I was going to make. One of the things that I felt was abusive in the past 
was that we set an, an artificial limit on the number of people. We said we would only take 300 people, for example. So it was the first 300 applicants. And of course, everybody in the know had put out the word to people. And literally, literally within one to two hours, we had gotten to the 300 mark and the whole thing was cut off right at that point. And anybody who figured that there was, you know, there was a deadline like in a week or two, but we cut it off before the deadline in some cases. And that to me was really unfair because if you weren't in the know, if you weren't a friend of or a relative of, um, I thought, I, I, I think you were discriminated against. So I like the idea that you're, you've broadened this, that you, you're, you're prepared to take a lot more people. Um, I would hope, uh, though, that one limitation would perhaps be, even though, well, would be geographical uh, location. I, I don't think we want to be moving people here from Massachusetts or something. So um, I, 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 I would focus as much as possible on local people. My local, I mean, within 50 or 100 miles of, of this area. Um, but but I think I think this is a really very thorough and and uh, and in depth um, uh, thought thoughtful process. So congratulations. Chuck, sure. yes, go ahead, Jim. You know, uh, you, you may reference to uh, you know some of the history that, that brought us to this point, and you know I, I just want to acknowledge uh, Chief Lorenzen's. Uh, work and uh, you know acknowledge that you know the presentation from Francine uh, in July was was of concern it was a great concern to me and you know to see uh, the response you know I, I want to make sure that you know duly note that you know your uh, initiative to create the DEI committee and then uh, the service uh, performed by uh, Robert and uh, in Virginia on that committee and, and then the board, you know, taking the action it did um, and then seeing the result of, uh, of all that in, in the chief's presentation this evening really encourages me that, you know, that there will be real meaningful changes uh, in, uh, in this area. So, uh, you know, thank you for your effort in this, Chuck. And uh, chief, again, I think it's, you know, what you put together here will produce results, you know, that, uh, uh, that will uh, start to move us towards a, a more uh, equitable and, and representative uh, uh, work environment. So thank you. I'd like to add on to that, Jim. Thank you uh, for, for your comment. Um, the, um, it's a ways off because presumably we won't do this till um, almost a year from now during the fall. But um, when, as we get closer to that time, I, I think um, we're prepared to do a much, much better job of getting you know, the candidates screening and, and a broader applicant pool and so forth. I think at some point we're going to have to look real hard at what, what people will experience when they come here. And we wanna ensure to the best of our ability that uh, the people succeed. And um, that's not necessarily in the selection process, but I think it's in the, what the chief has referred to in the last paragraph here is just some of the arrangements and conversations and preparations and trainings that take place at the district level to prepare everybody, staff, even the board, uh, for what's to come. So um, I, I'm I'm also very hopeful that this will be the beginnings of some some meaningful changes. Any other comments from anybody on the board? I will then turn to the. Um, for public comment on this item. Michelle, could you request public comment? If anyone has a public comment, please use the raise hand feature or press star nine if you called in. 
And Director Bernstein, I see none. Okay, and, and Chief, I'm assuming this is an information item only. There's nothing we need to, to we've, we've reviewed it and we've discussed it. There's nothing more we need to do at this point. Uh, all I need, I took some notes and we're gonna keep moving forward. Okay, I would just throw out one last thought and that is, and, and I don't know that there's any rule on this, but if, if in any way, any of the board members or our DEI committee or anybody can be helpful in the process when we get there, I, I hope you'll call on, on them, whether it's welcoming people or, or whatever it might be um, to show that the board is behind the things that you're doing. Yeah, absolutely, that sounds great. Thank you. Okay, item number um, 11, this is uh, uh, a request for some authorization mm -hmm. regarding change order for our our six uh, fire engines that we're in the purchase of, we're in the process of purchasing. Got it. This is my item. And I will say this up front, our attorney, Steve Miller, and I have had a number of conversations about this. And he's, while he says this isn't um, necessarily necessary, it's just, it's one of those things as I came in and it just felt like I wanted to make sure we were super transparent in our processes as um, you know, when we had two staff reports uh, that were prepared last year, they had not to exceed amounts on them. And we had some change orders that came through and it was brought to my attention that um, we had these change orders and it's over that not to exceed amount. And my, my general thing has been since I've gotten here, okay, let me share it with the finance committee and see what, uh, what their desire is. Cause well, I don't I don't want to surprise anyone. So I brought this to finance committee. They just the ask was we put together a brief staff report, take it up to the board and just give it give it to them for awareness. They can approve it. And so that's really what I'm doing here. This is normal and customary for us to have change orders. Our our um, purchasing policy and the contracts actually allow for a 10 percent overage. This happens to be. I think the actual ten change orders are about one and a half percent. So just for the sake of transparency, that's what I'm asking for is uh, accept the report is presented and then authorize these change orders in an amount not to exceed 100,000. That will give us plenty of leeway. The engines are on their way anyway. So that was this was an effort in transparency and um, like I said, I'll probably make some minor tweaks to staff reports in the future, and that'll make me feel better. So with that, any questions? But let me just clarify here. At this point, you expect the change orders to be a to totaling $68,776. The Finance Committee recommend that you went above that just so you wouldn't have to come back for another five or 10 or whatever it might be. That's correct. Okay. Any comments from anybody? I do have a comment, Chief. I'm in total support of this, both as a member of the Finance Committee, but just um, uh, as somebody, I, I, I may have even made the motion to make this purchase when we had it, but um, I, I would be interested in talking to Stephen Miller at some later time about this because I don't think if the board authorizes a certain amount of money not to exceed, I can tell you that I would be distressed to see the chief exceeding that number. And while there may be some rationale for that, um, I, I find it hard to imagine that that would be okay. To me, if the board offer, authorizes a certain expenditure level, then that's what it should be. And I think it, in normal times, it, I mean, normally it should include a change order thing or it should be slightly higher but than, than what one is expecting. But I don't think the chief is ever authorized to spend more than the chief is authorized to spend. So I, I'm 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 troubled by the legal advice, and I'd like to know more about it. I don't know if this is the sure. proper forum for that or or not. But um, um, uh, what, what would you recommend, Stephen? Is this something to take up either in closed session or at a later time? Or and you, you might, I, Steve. Steve texted me and said he was having. Can, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Oh yeah, we got you now. Okay, 
So I'm, I'm happy to answer. It's, it's, it's quite easy, I think, from my perspective. The term not to exceed is a term of art that's used when you're authorizing, when the board is authorizing a base contract amount where the amount is not 100% certain at the time of the contract award. So uh, I, I forget the exact numbers, but you authorize the purchase of these fire trucks um, in, in, in or pumpers in an amount not to exceed X dollars. That was the base contract amount. The use of that term not to exceed did not mean that forevermore the chief may not exceed that amount. The use of the term not to exceed meant that the base contract could not exceed that amount. Your procurement policy says that you delegate to the chief above and beyond the contract value that you've authorized, uh, the ability to exercise change orders either within a fixed contingency amount that the board authorizes at the time of award, or if there's no contingency in an amount of up to 10% above the base contract amount. So when you authorize the purchase of these pumpers in an amount not to exceed X dollars without setting a contingency under your own policies, you were authorizing the chief both A, to award a contract in the base amount not to exceed that, and B, to authorize change orders up to an additional 10%. That's just by the terms of your own procurement policy. That's that's what the board has decided the rules ought to be. Can, can I just clarify, just to be sure I, I understand? Sure. If the if the contract had called for a, a changes, say up to ten percent of the of the amount, would that would the purchasing policy have allowed another ten percent, or would that have uh, kind of used up the entire flexibility? So, so if the board had said, authorize the chief to enter into contract for X dollars plus establish a contingency of Y dollars, the chief's authority would be limited to that Y dollar amount and not including an extra 10% above that. But because you did not specify a contingency, your policy says absent a contingency, there's a 10% cushion that the chief may use to exercise change orders. Okay. Well, I think what you're saying sounds reasonable and so forth. I, it seems like what a good policy would be is to have the approval of, include the contingencies in the first place, and then there's no issue whatsoever with transparency or anything. So that would other? be fine. That's just not what your policies say. Right. Any other uh, comments on this item? Uh, I don't think we have a motion actually at this point. Um, can I have a motion to adopt? I'll make a motion. Sure. That's Rob. And uh, I'll second that. A second yeah. from Virginia. Uh, any any comments? Uh, any uh, public comment from the uh, from the uh, attendees? A public comment on this? Anyone has a public comment? Please use raise hand feature or press star nine if you called in. And again, I see none. Director Bernstein. Okay, well, let's um, proceed then with roll call vote. Director Jones? Aye. Director Crawley? Aye. Director McLaughlin? Aye. Director Solano? Aye. Director Bernstein? Aye. So the uh, resolution is approved 5 0. Um, and uh, we will move then to item number 12, which is a report on our compliance with, with uh, Cal OSHA requirements. And um, let, let, let me say, I, I just wanna introduce one part of this. In, in, the, um, in the discussion, um, is it the discussion? Oh no, it's in the background. It says, a board member raised the issue related to compliance with Cal OSHA workplace safety requirements. And I just want to, um, not make that anonymous. I was the board member that raised the issue. And this was this was something that um, somebody had suggested to me that perhaps there might be some things we were not doing or whatever. And the question arises, what does a board member do with that kind of information? And I, I just felt that the best I could do was to inquire of the chief 
what the status of our compliance with Cal OSHA requirements was. And so I did, and uh, this is the chief's kind of response. Um, but I, I, in part, this is, this is transparency on my part insofar as I'm trying to demonstrate to the public and anybody who might raise an issue that in fact, uh, we do represent the public and we represent the, the district as a whole and, and uh, that we would look into matters that could be of issue. I, I don't happen to believe that this is of issue at this point, but uh, that, that's why it's being brought up here. So with that introduction, Chief, would you go ahead, please? Got it. Thank you, Director. So thanks for the inter introduction. This is, um, yeah, this is my, my good faith effort at trying to address the um, somewhat unclear, you know, wonderings from a, a member of the public about our Cal OSHA compliance. So um, I actually, was going to bring this to the board last month, and I just didn't have a good enough grasp on the items uh, that we have compliance on. I can't guarantee this is an exhaustive list, but we tried to make it as close as possible to uh, everything that we believe we're required to comply with. So, um, what, what you have in attachment A is uh, basically our Cal OSHA compliance checklist. Um, we have good reason to believe we're in compliance with those items on there. Uh, we, you know, you know, there's a lot of things too beyond that. We have, um, you know, we employ a number of contractors to help us with our fit testing that help us track these things. We employ a company, um, the company's name is Dual Safety. They do fire station inspections for us. So, there, there are a good number of efforts underway to ensure our our workplaces, the static, somewhat static, and uh, workplaces reasonably safe, complies with all the Cal OSHA requirements. We have MSDS uh, material, material safety data sheets available for our employees. Um, you know, we've over the course of the you know through the COVID crisis, there's been a, a number of additional. Uh, Cal OSHA requirements related to uh, clients and all, all of those things. And we've had uh, three three people that have been our designated inf infection control officers, updated our exposure control plans. Um, so I guess in, in short, uh, there's, there is nothing that I'm aware of where we're not complying. Yeah, um, and that, like I said, that that this is a list of um, our Cal OSHA checklist of all the areas. So, with that, I really, hopefully, it, it gives Director Bernstein some assurances that I think we've got it covered. Uh, I mean, there certainly could be something that falls through the cracks. I'm just not sure where to find it. But um, anyway, with that, that is that's my board report. I'm happy to address questions or dig a little bit more if anyone has any specific concerns. Uh, so back over to you, Director. Questions or comments from the board? Yeah, just a quick question. So Chuck, did you ask him to, to the chief to put this on the agenda? I did. Okay. Um, cause, I mean, I don't know, unless we changed our policies and procedures, it's, I mean, I don't think it followed that, but anyway thanks for um putting this report together chief sure chief i have two two questions both both very minor here just out of curiosity about two-thirds of the way down the list there's a reference to lockout slash tag out what oh, does sure. that mean this is um it's usually used where you have mechanized equipment. Um, you know, if you think about a factory or an agricultural um, thing where it's a grinder or some, some kind of thing, before you enter into a situation that's dangerous, you actually turn off the machinery and there's a way to specifically lock gears from moving. So it's a kind of a, a, 
a term that's used in these industries, you know, that have uh, large machines or gears that could create crushing industries, uh, sorry, crushing industry in injuries or electrical hazards, things like that. But it's a, a common term used uh, amongst firefighters for making sure something's uh, safe and secure related to that also in a lot of the construction and agricultural industries too. Okay, thank you. And then just, sure. just a, again, a minor question. Cal OSHA obviously is California's version of OSHA. Does that, come, when we say Cal OSHA, do we also mean the federal requirements, o, the OSHA requirements? Uh, yes, I mean, typically what happens is that OSHA adopts all the federal requirements and then plus also has additional ones. They can adopt things that are more restrictive or more requirements than the feds. So generally, yes. Okay. That, that's that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you sure. for putting this together. Oh, sure. Who pleasure. knew that we had so many things that we had? I, I did not know, but now I do. And maybe you, if you could address what what do we do just on a regular basis or how do we do we assign these things to people or how is it that we we keep up on it? What what do we do to make sure that something that's due every two years is in fact done every two years? I mean, that's um, some of it is done, like I said, through contracts. Um, some of it is tracked in the training division. I, you know, I think we have probably uh, too many different methods. So I can't give you a definitive answer on every one of them, but the ones that are really critical, like our fit testing, you know, that's one of those things that we put in our uh, target solutions. So if somebody's coming up to due date, it's flashing there. Some of the other things are just things our contractors will catch and take care of for us. Um, but I don't know, I'm, I'll am i dig a little bit and I'll just get back to you um, and let you know via email. Okay. Any other questions from board members? Um, I'll open it up to the public then for any public uh, comment. And if anyone does have a public comment, please use the raise hand feature or press star nine if you called in. And Dr. Bernstein, I see none. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll move then to our reports and requests section of our agenda. Um, uh, committee reports, um, emergency preparedness. I have no report that Chief kind of talked about. Um, uh, that somewhat, so I just leave it. I don't have anything to add to that. Okay. Virginia, um, you have anything you want to add? Virginia, don't have anything you want to add? No, thanks. Okay. The Human Resources Committee. Yeah, uh, Robert and I met. We reviewed the outreach efforts, which is what we spoke about tonight. And we also spoke of the Workforce housing pilot program. Bit. So, Robert, you want to add anything? No, I, I don't have anything to add, Rob. Thanks. <laughs> okay, thank you, Robert. Thanks, Chuck. That's okay. Uh, strategic planning, Jim. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Rob and I met with uh, Chief Lorenzen and uh, Johnston. It was a very informative. Uh, meeting, there were two items on the agenda. One was uh, uh, water infrastructure in East Palo Alto. Uh, and, you know, there's been some significant development uh, there. The city has uh, committed to spending uh, several million dollars to uh, upgrade uh, some of the main lines um, that you know, will improve our ability to do uh, our work as well as, you know, there are a lot of other reasons, you know, to support future growth and development and provide better quality water to, uh, to some of the residents there in East Palo Alto, but all very positive. I, I think it will be a first step in a larger uh, effort going forward. So um, <coughs> I'm very, very uh, uh, promising. Uh, again, I want to recognize Chief Johnston, I know he uh, has done a lot of work with the city manager and, and uh, we will, we, the district will uh, 
well represented in the uh, in the staff report. You know, we had expressed our uh, concerns and some of our requirements, and um, you know, they they were addressed in the report. So again, very very promising. Chief, I don't know if you have anything to add to that, or Rob. Yeah, just uh, Jim, it's a, it's a shame that those residents in East Palo Alto don't have safe, a lot of them don't have safe drinking water. And what what was presented by by our fire marshal, our division chief, uh, at least the city of East Palo Alto is opening the door a bit to make some of those infrastructure improvements. Uh, and I'm comp I'm hoping that it'll provide those residents uh, some relief there relative to the drinking water aspect. That's all I have to add yeah. Chuck. Um, if I can just weigh in briefly, if, if anyone's interested, East Palo Alto is actually hosting this Thursday evening um, a class called EPA Water 101. Uh, come learn about EPA's water system. It's being hosted uh, at their city hall community room this Thursday night. So if anyone's interested, members of the public that may be interesting, I think I'm interested that I, I know they realize there's a lot of um, interest in their water system, drinking water and uh, water service in general. That's it for me, thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. you know, Chuck, there's just one other item uh, on our agenda. It was uh, the issue of, of the board, uh, you know, uh, learning about uh, major significant development projects within the district, uh, you know, perhaps a little sooner. You know, oftentimes we, we read about them in the paper uh, and, uh, you know, they'll, they're projects that could have significant impact on, uh, on our resources and, you know, affect the, the overall community that we, that we serve. So uh, Chief Lorenzen, uh, I, I see he did it uh, this evening, you know, address, uh, address this issue in his report. So uh, the chief has, uh, has said that he will uh, endeavor to mention uh, or describe uh, large uh, scale development projects within the district uh, early on when it's, a, when it's uh, appropriate to notice the, uh, the board. So that concludes my report. Okay. Um, Virginia Finance Committee. No, I think everything was covered in today, tonight's agenda. So thank you, um, Elaine, for all your hard work and, and long. I think that our finances um, how we report them and display them um, have gotten a lot better. So thank you. Do you have anything, Chuck? Nope, not at all. Thank you. Okay, I'll move to a liaison reports. Um, Atherton. Uh, nothing to report. Okay. Uh, City of East Palo Alto, and I have nothing to report on that. Um, City of Menlo Park. Um, I have nothing to report per se, although I am uh, wondering, Chief, when we're going to be scheduling our joint meeting, which was canceled twice by the city. Any idea? Back. I will reach back out to City Manager Murphy and check in. Okay. I think that's important now that the election's over and Measure V, you know, obviously didn't pass and we still have, um, it seems like, you know, this the same council that's in place now, so. Maybe we can talk about zoning as well. What what our I think I brought this up before about um, you know what of what zone descriptions are there for each of our properties? I think that would be good to know. Is that it, Virginia? Yeah, I would like to try to get that meeting scheduled since it's been put off twice. So Chief, if you could just reach out to Justin, I'll try to get this scheduled with Council Member Mueller as well. Sure. I will. Okay, and then uh, the county, Rob? Yeah, thanks, Chuck. Uh, I attended uh, on Thursday, they had the 
uh, Warren Slocum hosted the <laughs> Veterans Luncheon, which is the first time in a few years because of the pandemic. And uh, county, uh, the county executive, excuse me, was there in a lot of uh, county employees that were past vets. So that was my interaction with the county uh, this month. Thank you. Okay. And the um, Joint Powers Authority um, of Virginia? Yes, I actually have some things to report and I think the chief will probably augment what I have to say. So um, it looks like I, I got I've got some phone calls from um, other chiefs and also from our, our local 20 IAF local 2400 that today there was supposed to be an agenda item on the Board of Supervisors agenda to automatically renew the contract with AMR. And um, the, the people who called me were very concerned uh, since it sounds like IAFF 2400 made a pres did a presentation for the fire chiefs uh, at the fire chiefs, I guess the monthly meeting chief yes. um, about possible alternatives to uh, ambulance service in the county. As I mentioned last time at our board meeting, the September 21st meeting of the JLA, the JPA, the ALS JPA was canceled. And um, <laughs> that was not supposed to be canceled. And for whatever reason it was, and this item was never discussed by that JPA board. So um, I talked to the county manager on Thursday about the item and he expressed concerns because he had, I guess, heard from some others as well about the the issues with um, ambulance service. And so he, I asked him to pull the item if he would off of the Board of Supervisors agenda today <coughs> so that um, at least there could be more fact finding, which he wants to do or to, to understand the situation better. So um, he confirmed that the item was pulled and so they did not, the Board of Supervisors, they did not discuss this today. Um, I suggested to the county manager, I guess the county chief executive, that this that a presentation should be made at the next JPA meeting, which is supposed to be in January 2023, since these meetings are done quarterly. And we've I've only been to one this year in May. So and I think there was one in January. So at least 50% um, of the meetings have been canceled. And this renewal has come up and it was supposed to be rubber stamped as far as I'm concerned. Um, anyway, I am suggesting that if, and I, I don't know what's gonna happen because this just happened late last week with the cancellation. So it didn't make it on the board of supervisors agenda that we um, discussed, well, whoever's the liaison for the JLS or JL, ALS JPA next year or next time, you know, that we ask for a presentation from the firefighters and AMR, quite frankly, and, you know, any other ideas that might be floating out there. I don't know if that meeting's going to happen because I think the track record of holding these meetings is pretty dismal. So I would actually ask that our board, if we wanted to do this, um, at a future meeting, possibly do a study session and have the um, the firefighters come in and make their presentation and have AMR come in and, and you know, give us their perform their, their, their performance um, benchmarks and if they've hit them. That's contingent on whether or not we're good, that the, this contract is going to be renewed automatically. So, you know, I think at this point, there's really nothing to report, but I think in the future, there could be um, something that we can do just to understand what alternatives are, are out there and uh, have a study session if we wanted at our, for us, for the fire district and our fire board, and everyone would be welcome. And um, if, you know, this assumes that we don't have this meeting at the ALS JPA. So I don't know what's going to happen because the meeting got canceled. The ALS, ALS JPA meeting was canceled in November and then this came up. So I just want to put everyone on notice that 
you know, it might be a good idea for us to do a study session. So to keep this out in the open in a transparent way. Chief, I don't know if I've summed it up well, but do you have anything to add? Um, I think what I would add is that as you, so it's interesting, our, you know, in San Mateo County, the responsibility for approving the ambulance transport contract lies with the Board of Supervisors. So this is this is good. The fact that um, I think a couple board members were interested in pulling it. I think the uh, I think labor um, got in their ears. And um, so as you interact with board members, you know, if you can elevate it so there's at least a conversation surrounding this, that would be helpful for us. Um, you know, the first extension of their contract, I think it's uh, July 1st of 2024. Right. Um, like Director Corrali was saying, it's almost predetermined. They have to meet certain metrics and then the extensions uh, really pretty much automatic. The, um, the agency that has oversight for their performance is the local EMS agency. And, um, you know, they, the local EMS agency also grants exemptions for you know, some of the metrics. So it's always, it's not super transparent. That, that, that being said, the contract is up for re-extension or extension in 19 and a half months. That's not enough time for us to do anything um, to be able to pull together whatever it might be to compete, you know, against AMR and, and an RFP. That, that being said, there's some opportunities that, you know, once it's extended, it's extended for another five years, and then the county has to go out to RFP. I think there's some opportunities there. There's lots of conversation happening amongst the county chiefs. It should happen amongst all of our boards and city councils. It should happen amongst the county board of supervisors. It will just make the system better, I think, in the long run, if people are looking at how do, how do we make the system better. So those are really my comments. I think there's going to be a lot more to come in the future on this. But yeah, if you happen to be talking with a county board member, Good, good thing to have a conversation about. That's it for me. Any questions? Uh, Virginia, I have a question. Um, uh, this renewal that takes place in 19 months or whatever. Yeah, it's um, about 20 months, yeah. 20, okay. Um, there would have to, we would have to, I'm not recommending a change, but, but for a change to occur, there would have to be some cause. Is that correct? Well, yes, to a certain extent. It's basically whether or not they meet the AMR meets the performance benchmarks, that's right? I mean. That's so set they, out. They, and they, if if it's determined that they have, then the board will just automatically, you know, renew it. And um, but the firefighters believe, and I don't want to put any words in their mouths, but my understanding is that they're not so sure that those benchmarks have been met. Okay. I don't know, Chief. I mean, I wasn't at the presentation that you were at, um, so I, I don't. I don't know if you want to talk about that a little bit. All I know is that it was just an alternative way of looking at this. And Steve Miller has him. I am I getting off topic, Steve? Well, I mean, you very sensibly, Director Chancarelli, suggested that you know this is your report from the JPA committee, and you suggested a study session might be appropriate because it was of interest for the whole board to discuss. And now it feels a little. Steve, you're um, stuck. You froze, Steve. I hear myself. No. no now you're back, Steve. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. We well, lost you, Steve. Start again. <laughs> what, what, what I was saying was that in your report, Director Tank Rally, you sensibly suggested a study session so that the board could discuss this. And now it feels a little bit like you're having that discussion right now. And so yeah, perhaps and it's appropriate to, to, to agendize this for another meeting. I, I do, however, have another question. It's not about the actual thing, but I, I was just curious who who is who's who's the who's in charge of canceling the meetings? Who, whose decision is that? The executive committee of the JPA. And is the who who constitutes the JPA? The JPA is made up of all of a representative, an elected representative from the different cities um, who have a fire department, I except see, so for except 
for our district, because we have a district, Woodside Fire and Coastside Fire. So there's one representative for each of those, each of our districts. I see. So it's and basically- we are not on the JPA's executive committee. So it's our, our peers or our colleagues are the ones canceling the meeting. Well, I mean, the JP, the, that, that executive committee is made up of various folks, I think uh, within the, like, North, South, North, Central, and South, but also the, um, oh God, Mark, I can't even remember. I know that there's an elected person on there and then there's the city manager from one of the cities and the fire chief from one of the fire um, agencies. And in this case, it's North County Fire and uh, the city manager is the city manager from, I believe, is it Brisbane? And then the elected person is, um, from Central County Fire. Okay. Well, Harold well, used to be on the executive committee and then he's no longer on there. So I, I don't even know who else is on there right now, but those are the three main people I know. Okay, thank you. Uh, Rob, you, you, you had your hand up. Well, I'm going to uh, yield to Stephen's suggestion that, that we do not continue discussing uh, this item since it yeah, a study session would be a, a great thing to have. How about that? I um, agree. I Virginia, mean, and we can we can discuss that in the future uh, when when we want to do that. I just think that it needs to be out in the public, which is why I suggested the study session. Virginia, would you be recommending that we do the study session before year end or or after the beginning of the new year? Um, I don't know. Actually, I, you know, I don't know. I, I mean, we're supposed to have a meeting in January of 2023. It was the first meeting of the year, which is the quarter. And I don't know who the new executive committee will be. Um, so, you know, I don't know, maybe, I don't know, Chief, what do, what do you think? I mean, in some ways, I kind of want this to be out in the open, but at the, you know, as, early, as soon as possible. But I just don't know realistically it makes sense to do this before the before the year end. Yeah, I mean, my recommendation would be after the first of the year. I mean, part of it's going to be us just pulling together some valuable information, information for the board to consider. I'm not sure what that is yet, and then also getting people that can speak uh, to the questions. So part of it will be is um, you know what what specifically does the board want to study? You know what type of questions will they have? That way we can have people present that will um, help you informing your your positions and decisions. Okay. So that would be my recommendation. I know, Rob, I think that they called you too. Did you have any thoughts on timing of possible a possible study session? Well, I don't want to further discuss it uh, as, as Stephen had said, but there's a few facts and circumstances that I'm sure the chief's aware of and I'm aware of, and I don't want to further discuss it because it's not on our agenda. But I, well, I'm talking about the scheduling of, of a study session. So let me just make the decision. Oh, we yeah, should just do it after the year, the first of the year. Okay. I, yeah. I think it's up to the chief. Chief, you have more knowledge than than, than we do. Do, do you think we need to have a, a, a study session before the beginning of the year? No, I don't think it's um, okay. super time sensitive. He just said no. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. That That's all I've got. Um, okay, we move now to our ad hoc committee reports. Um, do, do we have a report from the DEI uh, ad hoc committee? No, unless Robert has anything to say. Robert, are, are you? No, I'm not. I don't have anything to say. Okay. Um, Uh, Jim, uh, the water um, uh, companies, you may have reported on this already. Yeah, I, I did in the committee report, Chuck. Thank you. Okay. And again, the, the ambulance services has never been um, mobilized. So um, it, it's, it's more abundant at this, at this point. Um, reports and requests of directors. Let me go in the order in which I see you on the screen. Uh, Rob, do you have any? Reports or requests? 
Uh, no, thank you. Okay. I'm making notes here. I'm just trying to catch up here. Um, okay. Um, uh, Jim? No, thank you. Uh, Virginia? Yes, only because this was not in our packet that I, unless I missed it, but I don't think I missed it. But we did get um, something from a member of the public who wanted, this went to our emails, or at least mine, um, about the whole Measure V situation. Uh, he wanted this to go on record in the public realm to say that um, the three directors, Solana, McLaughlin, and Bernstein, have misused their office by endorsing a ballot measure using their fire district titles. I would ask the clerk to forward this complaint to the district's council and to include it in the next board packet. So I didn't see it in the next board packet, but this came out on November 6th. So I don't know who else got this email, but actually, let me, I don't mean, I think it just went to um, Director Jones, Michelle, me, and he copied some some of the press, which I don't, I don't think they got it. But anyway, I didn't see it in the board packet and it was a request by a member of the public to um, include this. So Michelle, you have made a note to include that in the, in the packet next time. If you would like me to, sure. Uh, Chuck? Yes, Jim, go ahead. Yeah, it, would it be possible for her to for uh, Virginia to forward the email to the uh, three directors that she mentioned? Well, I think she said Michelle um, received it, so let's ask Michelle to forward it to us, to everyone. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it, because it was sent to Michelle as well, Jim. Uh -huh. I'll do that. Thank you, yeah. Chuck. Yeah. Yes. Go ahead, Rob. I have I have a series of exhibits to also be added to whatever's put on the official directive, a bunch of them. And I'd like that to be included in whatever publication is put out to the public. Huh. Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure of the mechanism for doing this. I'm not, I'm not uh, stating a position on it, but, um, um, uh, Stephen, maybe you could give me some guidance here. Uh, can the board uh, include information pertaining to something like like this communication? So I'm not totally sure I'm understanding this, but it sounds like um, <clears throat> there's a request to add some information to the packet for next month's meeting. Yes. Yeah, it, it sounds like it's it's perhaps. Uh, um, I, I'm not sure, a, a defense or a, or additional information or um, supporting materials pertaining to that letter. Uh, if, if there's no objection from the board, I have including information that the board wants to include in the packet for next month's meeting. Okay. Okay, Rob. Yeah, this just came in as from a member of the public asking for his email to be put into the board packet. Yeah. So I don't so, know how much y'all want to put in here to try to make a case if, if, if there is no case. So I'm just saying that this was just a, a request from a member of the public. And so I wanted to honor that request. Okay. So Rob, will you send the materials please to Michelle and she I will. Forward it from there. Okay. Um, anything further, Virginia? No, thanks. Okay. And uh, Robert? There, uh, I received something from, um, and I think every board member received it from ASME, local um, 829. It was a letter that, that got received. I don't know, if Steve, if you received it or not. Um, it's pretty disconcerting to me. I mean, I'm kind of taken back that they would, they would write this particular letter. Um, but uh, I understand why the letter was written. Uh, and I've been trying to look forward to look, look it up in our policies and procedures, uh, as well as board responsibilities. So I want to put this on the agenda 
Uh, we can do it in a closed session or we can do it open, but we need to address this particular issue. Uh, not, not it, It's a broader issue and, and how the board function. Uh, and I think it's important for us to, to make sure that we are able to um, uh, address it in, in a way that's, that's uh, uh, fair and equitable to everyone uh, that that's this a part into this letter um, and as a board, because I looked through the policies and we don't have anything to address that issue other than the one piece that I saw, which is on uh, section 5.8 5 5 of the board policies in terms of members conduct and responsibilities. It goes shadow, but it doesn't go deep. Okay, so your, your request is to put that on the agenda um, and mm -hmm. um, let, let, let's turn it over then to the, um, to the board to discuss here. Um, well, so before we go there, didn't we, shouldn't we have had an item on here for future agenda items? I thought that's what we're this, into right now. And yeah, but it's not it. on, it's not on our agenda as it used to be. Yes, it is. This is the request of directors. Item number 16, okay. reports and requests. Yes. So I we make used a to request. have an item specifically for that, but yes, go on. I, I agree I'm with you, Robert, a, by the I'm way. I'm making that request. Are you saying we need to debate it now? Or no, 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 no. Oh. Virginia, let me, please let me direct the meeting. Um, so Robert's made a request. Um, if you would like to address his request, please go ahead. I agree that it should be on a future agenda item, but I think it's, we used to have a standing item for future agenda item requests. And I don't know when that was taken off. I'm ha I agree with Robert and I support that this request be put, uh, that this request for, um, to, for this item be put on a future agenda to be put on a future agenda. Well, I, so I, I'm not, I'm not denying, I'm not saying that that shouldn't be, but I just, and concerned that these board agenda items that used to be on these agenda, the standing agenda items that were agreed by the board are no longer mm -hmm. on the agenda. Well, I, so that's I, all I have to say, but I do support Robert's request. We, we've been interpreting item 16 where it's reports and requests of directors. Somehow it was combined. And this is this is the point on the agenda where we do entertain requests for, for agenda items from directors. So, um, it may not be as explicit as it was, but we've certainly, this is where we've addressed it in the past. I think it uh, should be explicit again. I, let, let, let's deal with that separately and I'll, I'll leave that comment for, for um, our board clerk for right now. But in terms of the uh, item, um, so I, two, two directors would like to put this on the agenda. Uh, any comments from any of the other directors here? Um, I, I saw a hand go up on my screen. Yep. Is that you, Rob? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I think uh, it would be up to the discretion of the of the chief, since it is an employee, as to what his decision would be relative uh if the board should be involved in this uh so i'm kind of on the fence with it chuck okay jim do you have any thoughts here yeah i i do uh you know i i have read the letter and uh, i do think it requires some sensitivity so i would ask that perhaps the chief and uh steve miller uh, consult and decide whether or not it's appropriate, uh, it's an appropriate topic for an open meeting or you know, perhaps uh, you know, seek some guidance on the best way to proceed given the, 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 the personnel issues involved. All right, uh, Chuck. A. Robert, hang on one second. Let, let me get Jim's, Jim has requested the chief and then our attorney to, to weigh in here. Let me get that and I'll come back to you next. Sure, absolutely. Uh, chief, do you have any comments on, on that or a response for Jim? I'm, I'm going to let Steve weigh in first on, I mean, I, I know how I, 
Yeah, I'm gonna let Steve weigh in first, then I'll, I'll offer some comments if needed. Okay. Um, there are, it seems to me there's two issues here and I can't tell exactly which one you are talking about, the board is talking about and which the sensitivities are at play. <clears throat> the first is the sensitivity towards a response to the letter to the union and whether there are legal issues and sensitivities involved in that. <clears throat> but I think I overheard, um, I think I heard the board members also talking about just interest in discussing the issues underlying the letter, which have more to do with the relationship of you board members with each other. Um, and so I, I'm not sure what it is that you want to discuss. So I, I thought a little hard for me to, to know how to help you, how to help guide you through this without knowing that. Well, as I heard Robert's request, yeah. it was to put the letter on the agenda for discussion purposes. So that, that's a pretty, that's not as broad. You could, we could address the broader issue second, maybe, but could you address the specific issue first? Well, Chuck, if, if I could. To the chief about the letter and in terms of the district's obligation, the labor law implications of the letter, and he and I have chatted about that. I'd be happy to chat with you all about that, perhaps in a, in a forum other than this open session. I, so you're, you're suggesting that with respect to labor law and things like that, that should be, that should be discussed, if at all, in closed session. Correct. Emphasis on the if at all. Okay. Well, you know, I don't want this to get brushed under the rug. Um, and that's what it seemed like it's trying to trying to go to. We were let, let me finish. I understand you're turning. You got, you know, I'm not gonna give you that power, but 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 listen to what I'm saying. We have gotten a union, one that we have spent a whole hour talking to and trying to negotiate with our contract. They put in a letter uh, stating a particular complaint. And that's what I heard it is a complaint that it is more than I guess is a complaint, a real situation that has, has happened last month. And it has happened several times before then. Not, and not only with that employee, but with other employees. Uh, what I am saying as a board member we should try to respect what we, we get from um, our employees, our union, and, and may take the appropriate route. If we brush and say, oh, it, it doesn't matter, it does matter because we are, uh, I thought we had a fiduciary obligation, not only to our, our people that live in San Mateo County, but our staff as well in terms of give them as much of respect as we do anything else, any of these items that we have talked about today. As a board, it to me, it breaches certain things. It breaches uh, uh, protocol. It breaches uh, what we, we, as a board, how we treat people uh, in open public. Uh, and and, and I, you know, I just don't want us to be, continue to be teetering on a lawsuit possibly, and I leave that to our legal counsel to 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 to, 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 to guide us in that. Room. I just don't want us to continue to balance ourselves like that uh, uh, gingerly uh, over a, a comments that are are uh, reckless to me in some respect. Uh, you know whether it needs to be said or not. There are different ways that things get get presented to folks not in open public. And this is what this letter seemed like is, is addressing to me. So as a board, we don't work within our policies that we have to, to begin to address these issues like that, that come up. This is not the first time. I mean, it didn't happen before, over the last four years that I've been on this board. So we just, I mean, it's an opportunity to kind of take a back, step back and look at it and look at ourselves and how we conduct our business, that's all. Okay, um, Virginia and then Rob. Yeah, so I see this issue in two different ways, Steve. I think that you got um, this letter, which is in, which is titled Hostile Behavior from the MPFP, MPFD Board of Directors. And then you have the um, initial 
well, I don't want to say initial, but the, the, the reason for this email, okay? And so to have, to put the chief in a position to put this on an agenda that's actually about his five bosses really is not a good idea, okay, number one. So I think that's one issue. The other issue concerns the employee that um, is being discussed in this email. Uh, and, and, and I don't want to go into detail because I, I don't know what the labor issues are and personnel issues. So I don't want to deal with that. But I don't think that we should leave the um, we should leave it up to the chief to put an item on that should we should as a board be talking about on the first issue about board be members behavior, which I do think warrants being put on a future agenda item because people um, expect us to behave in a certain way. And maybe it's good or bad. I, I mean, I don't know. I, to me, I, I don't think it's great in terms of the behavior, but we are accountable to our constituents. And when we're accountable to our constituents, any email about us should be open to the public. So that's how I would bifurcate this issue, Steve, is the personnel issue that, you know, uh, about the behavior of towards the employee. And then the board behave, board members behavior, which I think the public is entitled to hear. The board members are not employees, right? So that's oh, not, a, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I thought you would stop because you froze. I wasn't sure anybody could hear me. Can you hear me? Yeah. So, so I, I, I'm gonna jump in. There was a motion or there was a statement that you wanted to schedule agendizes for a future discussion. I think that's perfectly appropriate. And in fact, the only way to have this discussion is the chief and I have talked about the personnel implications of that. And we're not going to talk about that this evening. But if you want to discuss the uh, board conduct, as I heard some of you mention it, that was me. a perfectly yeah. appropriate topic to put on a future agenda. I would urge you not to have any more discussion on this right now. But it sounds right. like there were at least two of you who wanted to put this on an agenda for a future discussion, and that would be the appropriate way to do this. And it would be a very focused, a very focused discussion on board behavior. And I do not think the chief should be making that decision about whether to put an agenda item on about board behavior, his five bosses. So I agree. If Robert, if you want to put the item on specifically uh, for that one topic of board behavior. I would uh, totally support that. I want to address this letter in relationship to that. Uh, we, right. Yeah, that, I'm talking about let me this finish. email. Hold on, wait, wait, hold on, guys, hold on. one at a time here, please. Yeah, 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 hold on. I, I think we're talking about the same thing. I'm, what I'm yes. just saying is that we got this letter. We need to, res we should respond. Maybe we shouldn't, but I think we should. And in that letter, it addresses issues that we have been sweeping under the rug, uh, at least for the last four years I've been on, on the board, on protocol, looking at process, looking at rules and procedures and etiquette, the etiquettes that we will perform as a board member. Uh, and that's part of what this letter is addressing. And I would prefer to have this session, uh, this meeting in closed session, uh, I don't like airing dirty laundry in public if we don't have to. And this is one of these things we just need to be together on how we're going to approach this issue and then to let the board, let the community know. Okay. Um, Rob, uh, go ahead. I promised to call on you after Virginia. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Chuck. Uh, first, I'd like to go, uh, if I may, back to reports of directors. Uh, since there has been an allegation made by Virginia saying that she received an email from a constituent involving my conduct, Jim's, and your conduct involving this no on V or yes on V measure, I'd like to use and put into the record certain exhibits that I do have that show endorsements from other political I, I, I'm entities. Gonna, I'm going to cut you off here because 
we already said that you were going to put that into the the record and that was going to be sent um and i think we're, we're one we're getting off this topic and and two we're going back to something that was already resolved so the information that you have um, is perfectly appropriate to be sent to the board and to be on the in the agenda in the packet for the next meeting so i, okay. I don't think you, i don't think you have to go back to that issue um the the real issue in front of us and and uh, Robert's Robert wanting now a closed session, which is slightly different. I'm not sure that that comports with uh, with Virginia's idea that this should be open uh, session type item. But in any case, that's the propo Robert's proposal was really out there first, and now he's he's clarified this to put it into a closed session. So let 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 let's try to just deal with that. Um, um, I have just a question for Stephen pertaining to that. Um, Stephen, the, the letter that came in, it was sent to all board members. Um, is that considered a public document? I mean, it's certainly a discoverable document. The question is, is it a public document at this point or when does it become a public document? It is 100% a public record. Already. Disposable already, no, no problem. And but and at this point to obtain it somebody would have to make a, re a request to obtain it because it hasn't been published in a sense is that correct that's correct okay um okay so let's 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 kind of get to the issue of should this be put on an agenda and robert so that i don't misquote you here do you do you want to specify that this is for a closed meeting discussion he was shaking his head so i would i would defer that to steve but it, it's my, you know, from from my perspective, um, I, yeah, I, I think these are issues that are, or this is a, a, a method of board conduct uh, and board protocol, uh, and I think we really need to try to make sure that we all are on the same page and what that's going to look like or should look like. Um, because sometimes you know things happen in life, and but you don't want to be held accountable for that all your life unless you have you continue to con repeat the same problem, uh, the same situ situation again. Uh, so uh, you know, for me, you know, I mean that's my my, you know, I'm gonna turn this loose, uh, loose, uh, and 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 allow our attorney to. To let us know, guide us in that direction. It's whether it should be public or, uh, or it should be a um, closed session. So that's my perspective. So Stephen, can you address please that that issue, whether this qualifies as a closed session item and so forth? Uh, unless there's something that I don't know about, this would not qualify for a closed session discussion. Okay, there it is. So your proposal then, Robert, is to have it be an open session item. <clears throat> can, can I ask a right, quick wait, question? Wait, Virginia, let me, please. I'll call on you. I see your hand up. Robert, I'm just trying to yeah, make sure. No, I hear you. I, I, you have, I haven't said anything. I, I left the, the, the answer and the, how we're going to approach is with Steve because he's our attorney. Okay. Yeah. So the, the proposal is to have this be an open session item. Uh, Virginia, go ahead, please. Steve, could it could the issue could the issues in the email be bifurcated into a personnel issue and um, a board conduct issue where one one issue would be um, would qualify under the Brown Act to be a closed session item and the other one could be an open session. And I, I don't know. I'm just I, I just threw that out there. Um. I don't see there being a personnel issue that requires a closed session discussion. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Virginia. Um, uh, Rob, go ahead, please. Thank you, Chuck. No, I, I, that's why I initially had had requested it to go through the chief, since you know he this individual is an employee of the chief, and it it may have the ultimate response from the board relative 
to him being identified the way he has been. But I, if it can't be a closed session, which is, a, I think it's a good suggestion by Robert to put it under a closed session. But if it, if it doesn't qualify for a closed session, I think it's, a, it's definitely a personnel issue. And if it needs to go further with the board, then whatever board members want to make the accusations and put it on the public agenda, so be it. Okay, um, I'm, I'm going to ask Robert, um, rather than replow old earth, Robert, if you have something new to add, but I was going to ask you to make a motion. To I, I, I do want to pile, I, and I think it, it lends itself to what Rob just got to mention, and it, it, it you know, um, it, the, the letter uh, indicate what was said to an individual, but you, you, we got to look beyond just what this letter, it's about protocol, our board protocol. Um, and, and, and what is it as it relates to uh, our relationship with, from a board to a staff member? Uh, you know, reprimanding people in public. That I mean, that that gets back to the etiquette, etiquacy of the board and how we operate. So to me, it's more of a, uh, as we go through our bylaws and look at ways in which to improve how we operate as a board. To me, this is one of those those venues or uh, incidents came up that kind of give us a reflection on how we operate. So there, there's there been cats and dog fight here in this board for quite some time. You know, it got better, but there is there was cats and dog, but we addressed some of those in in policy and what's appropriate in, in our bylaws right now as a board not operate. And this is one of those things. We just need to it because it's not really airtight as to what we do. You know, it's some good, nice words in there, but it doesn't really tell us what our next, if something like that happened, how do we as a board address that, that, that situation uh, in a way that's appropriate? So to me, that's, you know, that can be an open session, but I think that we really need to kind of, kind of figure out, um, figure that out because it's going to happen again. Would you put your proposal in the form of a motion, please? I don't want to misstate it. Well, I, I propose uh, make a motion that we uh, address the letter that we received from ASME uh, relating to regarding an employee uh, of the district. Okay, John. And Michelle, well, well, I'll second that. Is that a motion, Robert? Yes. yes. And Virginia, I'll second that. And um, Michelle, were you able to get the motion? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, so Robert's made a motion. Virginia seconded it. Um, are any last comments on it before we vote on it? Okay. Go ahead, Jim. You know, I, I don't have any problem discussing the, the, uh, the etiquette issue as it relates to the uh, board procedures, but the, the actual content of the letter, I believe, should be reserved for a, a, a closed session. I, I, I don't think we should be having uh, a discussion of the contents of the letter in an open forum. Uh, we can talk about it as it relates, you know, we can have the open board meeting. I'm sorry, Virginia, that you might find this to be somewhat challenging, but I, I'm sure you'll you'll get my point here in a moment. Uh, you know, the open forum, open meeting forum is a place for us to discuss our policy issues. But the actual contents of the letter, I believe, should be in a closed session. Thank you. Okay, Virginia. In response to Jim, our attorney just said that this letter is PRAsable, so any member of the public can actually get the contents of this letter. So it's not a matter of whether or not it's it's public or not. It is public. Okay, thank you, Chuck. May I respond? Uh, go ahead, Jim. You know, uh, 
clearly the letter is in the public domain. Our discussion of the contents should not be in the public domain, is my point. Okay. Um, seeing no further discussion on this, um, I'm not. I'm not sure, um, so Stephen. Maybe I could ask you: Is this a matter to ask for public comment, given that the public doesn't know exactly what we're talking about here? Or sure, it would be helpful to make sure that, to see if the public wants to comment on this for sure. And okay, you froze, Steve. You've frozen again, but I, I will. I'm going to open it up to the public uh, based on what I heard. Your the first part of your response. Uh, Michelle, will you ask for public comment on this item, please? I will. If anyone has a public comment, please use the raise hand feature or press star nine if you called in. And Director Bernstein, I see none. Director Bernstein, can you hear me now? Uh, we can hear you now. I, I'm sorry to have jumped ahead there. No, but... no, no. I apologize for this terrible internet connection. i just like to say, in if it helps clarify for Director McLaughlin, my understanding of the motion is that in saying you want to discuss the letter, it's not that you want to discuss the employee's conduct. You want to have a discussion about the board's conduct and the board's policies in the context of this letter. But my understanding is that the, the topic of this conversation is not the employee at issue and his performance. So if I'm wrong about that, then you should let me know. Okay. I'm sorry, Stephen. I I did not follow your your reasoning. So I understood you, and maybe I was wrong. You guys step Locked two again, two steps Steve. to the right, Stephen. I think we'd be okay. Because <laughs> we can't hear you. I don't know what to do. Okay, we can hear you again. And now he's frozen again. I think I, I'm going to proceed here because Jim, can, can, are you okay going forward with? Oh, Stephen, it looks like you're back. No, sorry. Um, do, do you need the response, Jim, to go forward to vote and so forth? Or I, I don't. I don't. Okay. Um, uh, Michelle, will you will you uh, do the roll call vote, please? Wait, Chuck, could she read the motion again? Oh, please? yes. Go ahead and read the motion. The motion is to address the letter received from ASME related, related to an employee of the district. Okay. And please proceed with the roll call vote. Director Jones? Aye. Director Crawley? Aye. Director McLaughlin? No. Director Solano? No. Director Bernstein. No. Okay, the motion fails uh, two to three. And um, can I Chuck? make a comment, Chuck? The um, reason why I voted the way I did. No, I, oh, I saw, yeah, I, I, I we're, we're kind of in a, going through the reports and requests, and you, you really had the format, but I, I'm afraid we're going to get into another discussion here. So uh, actually, um, if you wouldn't mind, Rob, I, I think I think we should move forward at this point. You, you've you've commented several times, um, and, and uh, yeah, well, that's the reason why. You know, I think this is this is you know it it involves all right. It involves the board, but it also involves an employee, and we have no idea what his present or past performance was, and he's the chief's employee, so that's. That's why, you know, I think a closed session relative to the incident would make more sense. That's why I did not vote for a public session on this. I think it's I, it's I, not I separate. Chuck, yeah. it's it's not separate. It's together. It's you all the same events. You guys are starting to repeat the same either. things over and you over. You guys missing the point. Yeah, but, it's two issues here. It's yeah. board That's right. There is pro Robert, board Robert, protocol. Rob, please. Broad protocol. Like I'm out of order right now. On the issue. I'm out of order. What? How do you deal with that? Other than try to talk over me. That's what I'm talking about. That's what the letter is is 
the first thing is addressing. The other has to do with a personnel issue, which clearly that's a that's a what the chief deal with. You're not dealing with the issue that the board has to deal with or should deal with. Directors, if I may interject here, since Steve is unable to speak, we have gone way, way off topic. Okay. And maybe we should add an agenda item about how to discuss sensitive information in the future. Um, not necessarily about this, but anytime something sensitive comes up, how can you discuss it, whether it be in an open session, closed session, and what the criteria is. But for now, we should truly move on with the board meeting yeah. and, and discussion on this item. Robert, did you have anything more in terms of your report or request that's not of the same? No, okay. I'm done, um, I'm done, Jim. Uh, so. I'll go move to the, the president's report. And um, l let me just say here that um, there may or may not be a secret about this, but I'll say that the person in question uh, here is me, and this pertains to my conduct at the last meeting. And um, I, I'm going to say uh, that um, I, I've, I've, I've thought a lot about the letter that was that was uh, sent. Um, I can say that I have been fighting for years for our volunteers, uh, including myself, uh, to be respected and uh, to be acknowledged and to be supported. And it has been a very difficult uh, uh, battle for me. Uh, but I, I think that the, the whole notion of respect is important. Um, I think everybody needs to be respected um, for who they are and what they offer and what they have to say and, and their rights. And I, I support I support I support the notion of showing respect and so forth. And in, in saying that, I, I I have taken to heart some of the things that were in the um, in the letter, and I've. In myself, you know, for myself, made the decision to be a little bit more circumspect, a little bit more careful, a little bit more cautious about trying to respect people's um, uh, feelings and issues. Um, and I, I think, frankly, that I could have done better, and I plan to do better in the future. So that's. That's my notion of it. I don't want anybody to think that I take that lightly, but I also take um, my duty to my constituents and um, the residents of the district and the volunteers who give their time and effort and creativity freely. Uh, that's a very important matter to me. It doesn't justify being rude or uh, disrespectful in any way. Uh, and I think that uh, in the future, I can do better than what I did in the last meeting. Um, and uh, so I, I'm just making the point here that I expect to take that into consideration in my future um, endeavors. Uh, and I very properly, I think, have been asked even by our district staff to be a little bit more circumspect, a little bit more cautious. And I, I, I plan to do that. Um, so that's all I want to say about it, but it's, I don't want anybody to think that I take uh, the issues lightly. I take neither the issues that I care about lightly nor the ones that other, ones, other people bring uh, to light. And so in the future, as I said, I intend to do better. Um, that's all I have for a president's report at this point. Uh, I'll move to public comment number three. Um, and I see one hand here. Um, uh, Michelle, can I just go ahead and call on Gary Bloom? Uh, 
Uh, yes, um, Mr. Bloom, I think you could speak now if you unmute yourself. Thank you. There we go. Okay, thank you. Um, appreciate the opportunity to comment on it. You know, I did listen in to the and and I guess use of the term public is interesting here, given you know my current situation as it regards to the election goes. Um, and I was on the last board meeting, and I have to tell you that I found the calling out of a specific individual to be really appalling behavior by the board. And it's my belief looking ahead, and all, that's all I can do is look ahead on this, is that the board should have very specific policies about how to discuss personnel issues in a public forum. And you know, my review of the policies manual suggests that it's not as clear as it needs to be. And I think if there's something to be put on the agenda, the thing that should be put on the agenda is a revision to the board policy, outlining the exact way board members should behave and how they should communicate when discussing a personnel issue in a public forum. But there's, to me, there's no justification for the way it was discussed in the last board meeting. That concludes my comment, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And could you uh, ask for other public uh, comment, please? If anybody else has public comment, please raise your hand or press star nine if you called in. And I believe that was it. Back to you, Director Bernstein. Okay. Our next meeting is um, uh, scheduled for December 20th. And um, uh, I've seen no further uh, items on our agenda and having concluded the business of the, of the meeting tonight, um, unless there's any last minute reminder or anything, um, I will, I'm prepared to adjourn. Any last minute comment here? Okay, well, with that then, uh, the meeting is adjourned at uh, 9.39 p.m. Thank you, Chuck.